So tonight, I want to teach from the subject, uh, the pressers, pressure. See, as pressers, as we are pressers into the kingdom of God, God is calling us to toe the line and hold up the standard and to put pressure on the enemy. John went on the offensive and told Herod what needed to have been said. Even though he was brought there, <clears throat> excuse me, he was brought there to entertain him. Instead, he told him the truth. And in this day where believers are taking down and we're trying to just gain the approval of the world, the acclaim of the world, the light to be liked by the world, uh, to, uh, to basically <coughs> excuse me, be worldly, we're missing out on the assignment that God has given us. The Lord have called us to be lights. The Lord have called us to be the standard. Amen. And to show the world how it's done. So we're going to put pressure tonight. Uh, the, the pressers pressure on the kingdom. God bless us now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I started to name this uh, message tonight a four-way clash between Jesus, John, Herod, and Herodias. But it actually would have been a five-way clash because we got to bring uh, Salome, uh, Herodias' daughter, into it. Or we could uh, have called this a study of contrast between love and hate, moral and immoral, right and wrong. Or just something kind of catchy. You, 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 you sent for one thing, but you got another. Because they sent for John, expecting to get miracles, and instead of getting miracles, they got rebuked. Amen. Uh, but uh, in, 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 uh, the, the point is, John said what needed to be said. Now, I want you to allow me to do something tonight. I'm going to do something that I rarely do when I'm teaching. I want to jump ahead of myself. I want to, I want to jump ahead of myself tonight and make a point that could wait, but I don't feel like waiting uh, uh, to, to, to get to it, I want to go on and uh, uh, say this from the onset because it's right on the, it, right at the you know, just, uh, just on the edge of, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue, on the edge of my brain. And uh, what I want to say is that the, the Bible is God's truth. Am I right about that? Everybody, everybody agrees with that. It's God's truth. It's, it's, not, it's not my truth. It's not your truth. It's God's truth. And since it's God's truth, it's overarching truth. There is no truth except the Bible. There are other things that are true, but when it's all said and done, the Bible will outlast society. The Lord says, heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot or one tittle of my word shall fail. When it's all said and done, the Bible will prove to be right. Those who are fighting the Bible, you in, you, you, it's a futile effort. You will never defeat the scriptures. Um, all of these little movements that come up, you, whether you call yourself awoke or you're actually asleep, uh, though anything, anything that contradicts the word of God, any, any ideology that comes up that goes against the Bible, uh, it goes south. They have their little chef life. They attract a few simpletons who don't know any better. They may they, they appear to be appealing to those who have no knowledge of Scripture. But for those who know the Bible and who, who've, read, who've read and who read the Bible, you know that the Bible is reliable. Amen. Amen. You can count on the Word of God. The word of God will see you through the best of times and the worst of times. Amen. And, uh, and when it's all said and done, when it's all said and done, 
when the believer finally goes home to be with the Lord, the Bible prevails even then uh, there because it tells us where we're going. And it gives us a, re a reason to be excited about uh, tomorrow. What a mighty, mighty book. And uh, one thing about the Bible is that it's God's truth. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the Bible is not, now listen to me, it is not a politically correct book. Political correctness and the Bible goes in two totally different directions. One of the major problems with co political correctness is political correctness robs us of the ability to cause sin to appear to be what it is. And that is sinful. When you try and be politically correct and you begin to use euphemisms where they shouldn't be used and to speak softly in soft tones about wicked things and we begin to uh, uh, call things what they are not, then we miss the whole point of the scripture. There's a reason why Hollywood and the left and the world uh, just hates the Bible so, and they never pass on an opportunity to um, to uh, take a swing at Christianity. You know, um, uh, uh, and that and one of the reasons is because the Bible condemns their behavior. If you look at uh, uh, Romans, I'm, I'm getting off just a little bit, but if you look at Romans chapter 7, turn to that, please. Romans, the seventh chapter. <clears throat> and we're going to, excuse me, we're going to uh, begin... Mm, Let's see with verse 11 says for sin taking occasion by the commandment Romans 7 and 11 Do you have it? For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me that is sin came in um and 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 took advantage of the lofty standards of the word. Are you following me? And he says, wherefore the law is, number one, holy. And the commandment, the word of God, holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made deaf unto me? God forbid. No, no, no. The word of God, which is good, is not deaf for us. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now what is he saying? He's saying the, the word, the problem was not the word of the Lord. Because the word of the Lord is holy. It is just and it is good. That is, it is beneficial. It's good for you. Uh, it, it does that which is good. Uh, he says, but then was that which is good made death, did it become death to me, no, God forbid, even when, and the part that he's talking about, the part that became death, is where the law showed him where he was wrong, where the word checked him. Well, when the word checks you, you can't, you can't, you can't see the word as killing you. Amen. When that preacher preached the word, he's, he's speaking hate. No, 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 no. The word of God is not hate. The word of God is love. Amen. Amen. The word of God is, is right. He says, God forbid but sin, that is, but in order that sin might be recognized as sin. That's what the word does. It causes sin to be recognized as sin. Political correctness keeps us from calling sin what it is. It puts a soft uh, bent, a, a soft tone on sin. So when we're trying to 
please the left and please this group and please that group and, and this political group and that political group and this immoral group and that immoral group. You, you find yourself, if you're going to try to make everybody happy, then you got to almost decide you're not going to preach the Bible. Because you know what the word of God does? It causes sin to appear sinful. My heart goes out to all of you who work, who work in, in, in environments where you can't tell the truth. Where you can't speak up. Where you, you can't utter the scriptures. You got to be careful uh, with what you say so that you don't get called before the boss. I'm praying for you. But you can't expect the preacher to do that. See. No, no, no. We, we who are on the front lines for the Lord, you have to say what the Bible says. And one, good preaching, good preaching causes sin to be unveiled. Amen. Every one of us, none of us in here got saved until the word of God offended us. Nobody gets saved without being offended. Because you got to come face to face with how sinful we actually are. How wicked we are. That we are lost and in need of the Savior. Now, until you've, you've come to that place, you haven't been saved yet. You say, well, you know, I just got saved because it was a thing to do and it's really no big deal. Well, you haven't been saved yet. No, that, that might explain your lack of interest in the things of God. That might, that might explain the apathy that's there. But, but for those of us who really got saved, what makes you get saved is you come face to face with the fact that you're lost. That we're lost, that we're nothing, that we're undone, that no matter what our family name is, no matter what the, how much money we may or may not have, it doesn't matter the education, whatever the case may be, we need the Lord. Amen. That's what preaching does. And see, when people don't want to be saved, they fight that. And, 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 and today, the world, has come up, the world has come up with terms to help people fight against God's truth and have you thinking that you are being mean or judgmental or evil or homophobic or visophobic or uh, you know all of these labels and that that's simply because people don't want to accept God's truth. Uh, they like some of these other religions that allow them to do what they want to do and still practice that religion. So the Bible is not a politically correct book. It does not call things what they are not. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible um, doesn't go along to get along. The Bible simply tells the truth. It's what you learn from the word of God. God's truth. Amen. Amen. And I'm not with anybody who's trying to outlaw portions of it, <clears throat> keep us from preaching portions of it. Amen. I, I, won't, I won't align myself with anybody politically or any other way that will cause me to have to deny portions of Scripture in order to be accepted in their company or in their group or in their ilk or whatever. Mm, the Bible is right. The Bible is right by itself. Now, now here's the point that I want to make. That, uh, that, that could, could wait until I got to the scripture. And uh, it, it's, it's a little, uh, little, little historical point, but, but uh, um, I wanted to talk to you about it because I think it's so important. By the time our text was written, this, 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 this kind of stuff is interesting for the 8 o'clock people. By the, by the time Matthew's, the book of Matthew was written, and, and the book of Matthew was written around A.D. 58 to A.D. 68. So uh, we're talking some 58 to 60 years or so after the death of Christ was when the book of St. Matthew was written. Now, uh, by the time the book was written, Herod and Herodias and at the time the story was being told, I want you to follow me, they were at the time 
married to each other. All right? They were husband and wife. Herod and Herodias. Herod <coughs> uh, went to uh, Rome to visit Philip and met Herodias, Philip's wife, and Herod set out and he wooed Herodias and took her from Philip. At the time, Herod was married to the daughter of King Aretas, the Nabitian Arab Arabian king, and when he married her, it was a political marriage, and it formed an alliance between the nations. And uh, as, as a matter of fact, as for a little historical point, the king was so insulted with the way uh, Herod treated his daughter that had it not been for Rome, uh, the Arabians would have totally destroyed everything that Herod had built up. Uh, uh, because they, they went to war over the way he treated uh, 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 the king's daughter. Amen. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Rome, Rome bailed Herod out. And uh, we'll talk more about that later. And Herod ended up losing, he ended up losing everything. But he was married to um, King Aretas' daughter, um, and uh, Herodias was married to Philip, Herod's half-brother. All right? They were married. But notice this. And they had been married at least a year because when they put John in prison, they imprisoned John before they executed John. They imprisoned him for a year. So when he went to see them and he made the statement, see, they, they put him in jail. So Herodias and Philip had been divorced for a while. Herod had divorced his wife and Herod had married Herodias. All right? Everybody's following me. Now you look like you're following me. Now we know that all scripture, who wrote the Bible? The Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that. Holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Am I right? Notice this. <coughs> Pardon me. Even though the Bible, Matthew's gospel, was written some 58 to 68 years after the fact. The Holy Spirit moves on Matthew to write about this. Notice the Holy Spirit refused to allow Matthew to play the game. The Holy Spirit would not, the Holy Spirit refused to recognize Herod's and Herodias' marriage. For notice what the Holy Spirit does. In John's gospel, in Matthew's gospel, excuse me, chapter 14, verse 3, it says, For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother, Philip's wife. Now that's Matthew's personal commentary on it. Matthew doesn't call her Herod's wife. Even though they, she had been divorced by Philip by now for some years. And married to Herod. But the Holy Spirit never called her Herod's wife. The Holy Spirit called her 68 years after the fact. Philip's 
Herod's brother's wife. And an interesting note is that Herodias was the daughter of Arist Aristobulus, another half-brother of Herod, which made Herodias Herod's niece. Isn't that something? Living in the palace with all that power. With all that power, that immoral and that wicked. And with no shame. And, but the Holy Ghost, here's my point, would not go along with the game. So what, what's your point? The Holy Spirit has never, and to this day, and never will, call Bruce Jenner Caitlin. He doesn't do things like that. The Holy Spirit would, would never, now you might, and some of us do it, and we claim that we have the Holy Ghost, and some of us don't have the Holy Ghost. A Spirit-filled man will never, the Holy Spirit will never call a union between two men a marriage. Because it is not. It is not. Right. Or a union between two women. We, we are married. No, you're not. Right. You may be in a mess, but it's not a marriage. Right. Say, so what well, the law of the land says it is. Yeah, but there's another law. Yeah. I just told you that the Bible is God's truth. God's truth doesn't call that a marriage. God hadn't changed his mind. Am I right? I'll tell you something else. God uh, the Holy Spirit hasn't done and will not do. The Holy Spirit would never call a transgendered man a woman. Or a transgendered woman a man. Because a transgendered man, uh, I hope I'm saying it right. I might be back, but I get confused. <laughs> I get confused. He, he, Trying a man call himself a transgendered woman, that's a man. And a woman calling herself a transgendered man, that's a woman. The Holy Ghost would not play that game and, and be politically correct and say to this woman who is trying to be a man, the Holy Ghost wouldn't say, hey, my buddy, hey, guy, hey, man, how you doing? Mm-mm. Because that's a woman. Or oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. You see, uh, that's my point I'm making. See, the Bible is true. You're in a day where you can't hardly tell the truth. Homosexuality is a parasitic lifestyle. It's a parasitic lifestyle. Don't you turn that channel. Parasites cannot survive on their own. They have to latch on to another life source. When that life source dies, they go to another. Homosexuality cannot survive without heterosexuality. Can't. Because they can't reproduce. Without some form of heterosexuality, homosexuality is dead in the water. Heterosexuality, on the other hand, would be just fine. In fact, would be better off if there was no homosexuality. It wouldn't affect, it wouldn't affect the existence of heterosexuality at all. 
because the, the heterosexuality is not, it's not, a, it's not a parasitic lifestyle. It, 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 it brings forth life. Adam knew Eve, and she brought forth. She couldn't see. You follow me? See, this is the, the I'm just listing some of the problems with biblical Christianity. See, and, and as we turn from it, we're seeing problems in the world. You know, everybody's talking about uh, the school, the school shooting. Now, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble on this, one, but I'm going to get in it because I'm going to tell the truth. <coughs> now, now, we, you know, everybody's saying we uh, need to get rid of guns. And uh, it's the NRA. I didn't know that. Was that boy a member of the NRA? We, we got to get rid of them and kill them. But you know what? Let me tell you what our problem is. We put God out of school. Yeah. Let, let, let's, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back to, 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 to where the problem started. We took prayer out of public school. Teacher, uh, just a few months ago, a high school coach, coach's job was threatened for praying with his students. I'm surprised we don't have more shootings. I have said for years, any place where God is barred is cursed. Look at what we've done with the pillows of society. We have just basically decimated marriage. All right? And we'd rather, you know, black folk, we're just so gullible. Uh, uh, if, if a Democrat said it and they said it came from Africa, we believe it. Hillary said, there is an old African proverb. It takes a village to raise a child. Black folk just grabbed hold of that. Number one, I don't, I don't care. I don't know if it's an African pro proverb or not. But God said it took a mom and a dad. Now, we didn't grab hold to that. So we didn't grab that one now. So to raise a child, you need, child need parents. Praise the Lord. You're not saying amen. amen. And so we, we're in a society today where, where the, the home is under attack. The authority of the father is under attack. And see, uh, the other day, 17 young people were not murdered that day. That's what they report. They said it was 17. Now, uh, it wasn't 17. Truth is, it was at least 4,017. The first 4,000 was aborted. See, you cannot, what's the point? You can't affirm the sanctity of human life and kill human life at the same time. See, if life in the womb is not sacred, life at school is not sacred. That, that, so there's your problem. See. Oh, oh, look. Right here. That's your problem, right here. It's the Bible. We, we, have, we have turned away from God. And we've decided that we know what's best. Now, according to the Miami Tri Tribune, the Miami Tribune ran a story and said, because they ain't going to run this story anymore, said the boy, a Cruz, they said he was bullied, he was ostracized, he was criticized, he was all of them, you, you know, all of them things. All of the size. Now, we, we're against bullying, right? All right? Now, let's say that that story is true. Some of, our, some of the same kids who have all the mouth now and have all the answers may have been some of the same ones practicing the wickedness and the boy, the devil took over them. Boy, crack. What he did was evil, evil. and wrong. Yes. But you know what? What they're doing is wrong and evil. And Amen. if we don't bring back the word of God, the biblical standard, praise the Lord. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. I know what you ought to be saying. 
Thank God for somebody telling the truth. If, if, unless we bring that back, that there's going to be an increase. You can't confiscate enough guns to make society safe. See, see, we're trying to have it our way. If you really, if we're really concerned about the safety of society, and we're really concerned about uh, the loss of human life that take place every day. Let's, before we ban the, the assault rifle, which many more kids die per year, people die per year <coughs> uh, by the handgun. Handgun deaths ru run up into the thousands per year. Uh, the assault, so called assault, assault re weapon in the hundreds. So, so much for that. But if you really want to, if you just that, that concern about public safety, ban the wheel. There ain't nothing killing people like riding up and down the road in 5,000 pounds of metal going 100 miles an hour <laughs> in cars. What is, what is my point? my point? My point is we're in trouble because we moved away from the Lord. Amen. And we're trying to solve these problems by dancing around things. And uh, we need to bring, bring the Lord back and ask God to help us. And if we do that, will be in much better shape. But this, when you talk like this, you're applying pressure. The world, the world don't want to hear that. I, I can hear him now saying, did you hear what Wooden said? I can't believe it. I can't believe, believe it. Because I'm telling you the truth. You can't, we can't slaughter babies like we're slaughtering babies and, and, and expect the elderly and, and high school students and, and human beings to be respected. We have cheapened human life. We've said that it, that it doesn't mean anything. Can I get a witness? So now let's, let's look at this. Let's look at this text tonight. Let me go back to it. So my point is that I jumped ahead of is that the word of God is not politically correct. God never acknowledged Herodias as Herod's wife. Now this Herod was... The tea tretch. My time is almost up. And uh, a tea tretch, word tea tretch <clears throat> literally means ruler of a fourth part. Uh, and it went on to be used to mean a ruler in general or anyone who ruled a section of a country. Herod the Great uh, had many sons, and when he died, he divided his territory into three. And, uh, and with the consent of Rome, he, he, he gave the territory to his three sons, uh, Achilles and um, Philip and, of course, Herod Antipas. And he gave them, um, uh, Achilles, he gave Judea and Samaria. And uh, Herod, he gave uh, uh, Trecontus and uh, uh, Isaria, and to Herod he gave Galilee and Perea. So he gave them uh, these territories, and the, the sons uh, they they um, they rule. Herod Antipas was evil. He was evil, debauched, shameless, henpecked lustful, and given to every kind of access. And he had, uh, now he had more conscience than his wicked father, Herod the Great, uh, but he didn't have the courage of his conviction. So this is the, the wicked man who is in charge. And it could be said that to the extent that John was honored, Herod was despised. So you got Herod, this despised leader. And another reason he was despised so was because of his cold-blooded atrocities. He had members of the Sanhedrin killed who questioned his authority. And you do remember that this Herod Antipas was the same Herod that had all the male babies killed in Bethlehem while trying to kill the baby Jesus. So they hated, they hated Herod 
um, um, uh, they, they, they hated him. Uh, and, and listen, Herod had one of his wives and two of his own sons executed. So he was a, he was a wicked leader and he was hated uh, indeed. And this wicked, hated man in authority heard of the fame of Jesus. You see, Jesus' fame had taken off. And uh, Herod had uh, two houses. He had two palaces. And one, <coughs> excuse me, was in Tiberias and, uh, and the other, Mercurius, Maturus, excuse me. And um, an interesting thing is that Jesus never went through Tiberias. Even though Tiberias was in walking distance to Capernaum, Nazareth, and Canaan, he walked all around those lands, but he never went there. Some believe that he never went there was just to avoid Herod. Herod was wicked. Isn't it something that a man could be so wicked that the Lord would avoid him? See, the Lord, the Lord would avoid him. But somebody said, well, Jesus tries to save everybody. He avoided Herod. As a matter of fact, he called Herod in Luke's gospel, chapter 13. This is why you want to get right. He called Herod a fox. Luke 13 and 32. And he said unto them, go tell Go ye and tell that fox, speaking of Herod, um, behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfect. Isn't that something? See, they, uh, they, 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 in verse 31 it says, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, get thee out and depart. Hence, for Herod will kill thee. Same Herod Antipas. And Jesus said, go tell that fox. So I told you the Lord wasn't politically correct. Go tell that fox that today I cast out devils and do cures. And uh, today and tomorrow and on the third day I shall be perfect. So Jesus uh, avoided this wicked man, this wicked ruler. And not only was he wicked, but he had a guilty conscience. And uh, he had this guilty conscience because he had killed John. The Bible says in uh, verse 2, it says, And said unto his servants, after he heard of the fame of Jesus, <clears throat> pardon me, said to his servants, This is John the Baptist, he is risen from the dead. And therefore, mighty works do show forth themselves in him. This man thought that John had come back to life. Now, the, th the thought that John had come back to life did not originate with Herod. Look at Luke's gospel right quick, uh, chapter 9. I feel like tonight all I did was lay some foundations, but it'll get better. Luke chapter 9 and uh, verse 7 says, Now Herod the Tetrich heard of all that was done by him, by Jesus. <clears throat> and he was perplexed because that it was said of some that John was risen from the dead. And some said that Elijah had appeared and, and of others the, uh, that one of the old prophets was risen again. And Herod said, John have I beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? And he desired to see him. He went from saying that he killed John to believing that John was back. And he believed that John was back because that's what everybody was saying. And uh, one writer said this, that one of the reasons that Herod may have believed that John was back was that Elizabeth, the mother of John, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, was close kin. And there's a traditional belief that Jesus Christ and John the Baptist in appearance 
was quite similar because they were blood relations. So to see one could almost be like seeing the other. And, and here is Herod knowing that he had beheaded John. And yet everybody is saying that John is back. What do you do with that? He began to believe it. So now his conscience is bothering him. Uh, by the way, Herodias, his wife, she had no conscience. None. She was fine with everything uh, that was going on. Any, any mother who will put up daughter up to do a, a lap dance got to be morally bankrupt. Just, just as corrupt as, as you can be. Uh, Herod is tormented by what he did to John and now he believes that John is back. Now, I'm going to have to take up right here Sunday and we're going to move forward. Take this foundation that I have laid and uh, go back and study the scriptures and you will see that I have told you the truth. Bow your heads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight for your word. <coughs> for your word is right and your word is true. Your word is holy. Your word doesn't play games. Your word is right. God, give us to be right. To walk right. To talk right. To walk in your word. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, to be like John. To be fearless. And to stand on your truth. In the name of Jesus. I pray for every soul tonight. God you know the needs of the saints. You know the needs of the saints. I ask you to touch every soul. I ask you to deliver every soul. I ask you to break every yoke tonight. In the name of Jesus. We come against the devil. Satan the Lord rebuke you. And the hand of God is against you. He's against you. And we will not be driven into the closets. We will not be driven to silence. But we will stand on the word of God. And say what God has said. In the name of Jesus. For Father, your word is right. And your word is true. Now Lord, touch and heal. Touch and deliver. And keep every soul. In Jesus' name, thank God. Amen and amen. Would you praise the Lord for his word? God bless you tonight. Hallelujah. God bless you.